That is correct. So um, I don't know whose voice that was, but Anastasia told me um, when I saw her towards the end of last month that uh, she actually had the first patient and she just hadn't entered them yet. It was Christy. So that was um, so they extracted was through the Epic. So no, so when I when I say they're they're doing chart abstraction, so they're they're entering into Redcap by looking at their EMR. Their EMR is is GE. It's all scripts. Oh, got it. Okay, so like ours. Got yeah, so very similar. Um, we're, okay. we're ready to load. We're actually we've got more than one ready to load. Awesome. <laughs> I, you know, there's nothing like a little internet work competition. So uh, I know. So yeah. you can tell them where we've got at least what? How many, Neil? Yeah. 13. 13. 13. Oh, you get, that'll, that'll be awesome. Um, so we're, we're chomping at the bit here. So. You should also know that like some of the other um, some of the other centers don't quite have as much clinical research assistant time and so um, I know that in Alabama they're only going to be entering SDR patients. Um, I think that uh, primary is probably going to enter a little bit more than that but it may only be uh, back off and pump at SDR patients um, and you know, Michael and Jen, you can talk to us about what your plans are, um, you know, at, at uh, a point in, in the, this call in a little bit. So, um, but I'm, I'm very excited to hear that, Christy. Uh, yeah, we're, okay. in, we're, in, we're enrolling across um, GMFCS and intervention or not intervention, well, extremely intervention. So yeah, we're, no, and that's, yeah. that's great, but it's also because you've been able to get Neil dedicated to this, whereas everybody, yeah, exactly. some, some people are, are robbing, yeah. They're robbing from Paul to pay Peter. In some cases, these are uh, HCRN uh, clinical research assistants. They're actually fully paid for by HCRN, and they're going to be entering Got some it. CPRN data. So uh, anyway, uh, it. kind of a funny situation. All right, so um, the purpose and scope of the registry is to really uh, make it so that uh, investigators can understand the degree of variability, um, progression, and current treatment practices. Um, for both children and adults, so we have um, a, we have lifespan uh, centers, and in, in fact, Michael, I don't know to what degree you'll be capturing any data that's lifespan oriented, but I know you guys are a life, you know, have lifespan capabilities, but several centers have that as well. I don't know if you want to comment on that, but um, I know you're a pediatric guy, so I assume you're only going to be capturing pediatric data. We're, oh, but we have adult patients. So uh, ultimately, the answer is we'll capture anyone. Yeah, good. Um, so the second the second uh, purpose is to collect data for hypothesis generation and to help design uh, future studies. So you know, one of the examples I love to use from HCRN is we we planned a pilot study that was going to need 92 patients to power it appropriately, and we were able to predict uh, to the month, if not the week how long it would take to accrue those 92 patients because of the volume of data and the consistency that we had across those sites. That said, when we've done randomized, it's, it's always harder because you've got a, a lot more variables you have to uh, take into account. But the kind of preliminary data that will be produced by this to help with granting is, is, is huge. Um, so. Um, so the CPR registry is quite unique in terms of uh, the breadth of things that it collects versus many other registries, so collecting things from both clinical visits and surgical events uh, and across multiple disciplines, so orthopedic surgeries, neurosurgeries, and then clinic visits with developmental uh, pediatricians, PM&R docs, and PT, and, and also some PM&R docs are doing uh, sort of minor surgeries with like Botox injections and the like, and covering that as well. Uh, the registry is um, is taking in uh, not only multicenter data but all etiologies. So anything that uh, meets the definition of cerebral palsy uh, is going to be captured. Um, and as I mentioned in the discussion of Epic, the ultimate vision of where we're going is, is EMR-based data collection. Um, I think the breadth of data points that we want to collect um, and the volume of patients makes it kind of prohibitive to do it in a long-term way uh, with clinical research assistance as, as you're planning. And as I'm sure you'll experience, Christy, um, with yeah. your, your patient, patient volume, it's going, to be, it's going to be a lot. And I think it, 
it won't be sustainable from a, an affordability and from a richness of data set in the long term. And we'll, part of what we're doing in our initial year is trying to get a sense of how much variability is there going to be in, in data quality, data, um, the number of fields that are filled in and whatnot. Um, and so um, that's, that's one you know, key thing uh, to note. So we really, but we really think the value of being able to look at data that comes from the EMR directly and data that gets abstracted into REDCap is going to make for a study unto itself. So we're, we're looking forward to that helping shape um, you know, this, this pilot of the registry. Uh, and then the patient reported outcomes registry, which is launching imminently, um, is intended to go to, to parents and adults. And the goal was to make, make it so that it's linked through a global unique identifier, or GUID, one of Paul's favorite weird programmer words, uh, to make it so that we can create a linkage with the patient's uh, permission between the, the rich clinician and therapist reported data that is in the, regis in the clinical registry and to be able to link that to the patient reported outcomes. And that, that opens a door to uh, kinds of research that are typically very difficult to do. Um, so there are a number of investigators on the on the registry um, uh, protocol um, in addition to each uh, as it gets submitted at each site, but this this largely represents the management team or the the executive committee for CPRN. Um, with Jacob Keen, uh, who was not able to join us today, as the DCCPI, um, and Susan Horn as the lead biostatistician at the University of Utah. Um, and then the other, uh, the other folks that have been participating since the beginning of uh, CPRN. So with that, um, oh, I've got registry inclusion criteria. I forgot a slide. Um, so in general, at every institution, we're shooting for a waiver of consent. That's how the Reliance IRB was done. Um, and so far, every site, with the exception of two, has done a waiver of consent to have done opt-out consents, which are the next best thing from a not creating selection bias perspective. Um, you know, we're trying to enroll, as I said, all people that have a diagnosis of cerebral palsy um, and to capture them at any, like we don't want to only capture them at a surgical point um, or only capture them when they're first, you know, enrolled and come through CP clinic for the first time. We want to get them annually. If they're, if they're seen annually, we want to get them related to procedures uh, whenever, whenever they're coming in and there are related fields to be updated, uh, we want to be capturing all that um, information. So, um, and so, you know, it, it, so it's a prospective uh, database. We're not asking you, I mean, you've got, you, you started collecting, Christy, because you you know what it is you're, you're collecting, so you drew your line in the sand, but we're not, you know, looking for people to go back and fill in from right. past, uh, past visits, so. Um, and then the, the key, ex, uh, Exclusion criteria is other neurodevelopmental conditions. Um, and Christy, I saw you had a, ma a mail out to Gary. Hopefully he'll answer that soon to be to you. clarify your, your inclusions. Um, so any questions on that introduction? Okay, Sam, it's ready for you to tell me next slide. <laughs> Great, so we can go to the next slide. Um, so the red cap, um, part of the project, we're using the research electronic data capture software to collect information on patients um, with cerebral palsy where, at sites where EPIC collection isn't available. Um, so we have 19 different data collection forms in this project, and you can see them listed here. Um, bracketed are kind of what group or what specialty um, that these forms are supposed to be filled out. Um, so you can kind of see that there's a lot more forms, forms for neurosurgery, forms for ortho, um, things like that. It's just to kind of keep them organized and let everyone know what they go with, really. Um, and these forms, you can go to the next slide, um, are grouped into events, which you will see the events when you go to add or edit a record. Um, so when you first log into REDCap, um, the left-hand toolbar is kind of what you'll be using most. Um, you'll select Add Edit Record, and it'll take you to this next screen, or you can choose to add a record um, or edit an existing record just by clicking the drop-down menu. If you want to go to the next screen, 
And then after uh, selecting a record or selecting um, to add a new record, this is the event grid that you'll be taken to. Um, and you'll see that, um, so the columns on top, um, marked in green, are the events. So we have enrollment, an annual visit, uh, pre-op visit, surgical intervention, um, post-op follow-up following a surgery, um, and then the unenroll event if a patient wants to um, opt out of the study. Um, and so you'll see that there are gray bubbles um, for each of the forms in the left-hand column um, indicating that that form is present in that event. Um, so in the en enrollment event, there are four forms, the demographics, patient consent, vital signs, um, and birth and development history. But you can also see that these forms are not necessarily um, unique to, to one specific event. For example, vital signs and body measures is something um, that can be collected at, both at enrollment and annual visit, pre-op, surgical, and post-op. Um, so theoretically, the way this works is you choose an event that is happening and you fill out the forms that are associated with that event. Um, and you'll just uh, choose the empty gray bubble to add information. And if, say, there's an annual visit and you've already filled that out and you're at another annual visit or maybe they had a follow-up sooner than that, you can click Add New um, located in yellow at the very top. Um, and that'll add a new column for a new, a new event of that same type. So if you click Add New for Annual Visit, another column would appear indicating Annual Visit number two, say. Um, and you'd be able to fill out information on all of those forms again without overwriting the previous data. Um, and what's nice about this is that it allows for longitudinal data collection, um, which is really important for this study, um, and collecting as much information as possible without overwhelming you with, you know, eight or nine or ten annual visits. Um, you can just select the amount that is appropriate to be used. Um, and so if you want to go to the next slide, um, this repeating um, events or instruments um, tool in REDCap, it's very useful for this. It works very well. It allows a greater amount of flexibility. Um, and so we won't watch this video today because it's about 30 minutes. Um, but this video linked here, um, it's very useful in helping to understand how this works. You can even just watch it kind of quickly um, just so that you better understand how this works because it's slightly different from um, data collection in just a normal longitudinal red cap. Um, and if you have questions, of course, after watching the video, you're welcome to email me or Paul, and we're happy to help however we can. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide. Uh, one important aspect of this that Paul mentioned, the GUID, um, is our CPRN patient ID. I have that right, right, Paul? Yeah, this, this is not the GUID, but this is a critical other ID. Um, gotcha. So um, the CPRN patient ID is composed of just the acronym CPRN and then a site ID, which is assigned um, and assigned to each site, and we'll give that to you. Um, but it populates based on where you are. Um, and then a record ID, which is just automatically generated by REDCap. Um, so this is just to help keep um, each patient distinct um, and to allow us to analyze them by site. Um, but like Paul, I think you mentioned later in the slideshow, it's important to keep a mapping between the CPR and patient ID um, and other patient identifiers. Like if you're using an MRN, you want to make sure you know, oh, this MRN is associated with this CPR and patient ID. So it's, it's not terribly difficult, but it's just something you want to maintain as we go along. Um, next slide. Yeah, you, I would just add you absolutely need to maintain like an Excel spreadsheet that has uh, MRN and CPRN ID uh, per row so that uh, when you go to uh, update something on a patient, you can find their ID and not create uh, a new one that uh, potentially collides or whatever, or tries to collide or something like that. Exactly. Um, and so the other important thing that I want to mention in this is that so REDCap does not automatically save your data as you type, which is 
kind of a bummer. Um, you have to save the record when you're finishing entering data. Um, so you'll want to, when you finish with the form, this one pictured right here is the demographics um, form in the event enrollment. Um, so after you're finished entering data, you'll want to change the status of the form from incomplete to complete. Um, if the data hasn't been verified, there's also an, an option for unverified data. Um, and then you'll just want to save uh, the form just at the bottom. You can either save and exit the form or save and go to the next form, just depending on how you click there. Um, but that's just something that if you don't do it, it, it really will go away and all of the data you entered um, will have been for nothing. So save the form. Um, and next slide, we can do a brief red cap demonstration if we have time. Um, and I'll just narrate to you, Paul, and you can kind of navigate if we want to do that. Or we can skip it, um, whatever. Well, let's ask what people would like. Um, uh, hopefully, I'll be able to navigate with your, your instruction. But would that help you, Neil, Jen? Yeah. Okay, okay. great. Um, so if you want to click on the link, that'll Actually, be Actually, so I'm going to I'm gonna go in through, because I'm going to need to share this window. And so let me. Um, Oh, gotcha. uh, I'm assuming you guys can't see what you probably are still seeing slides, and yeah. so okay. I'm going to go to Red Cap. I so I'm going to come in as knee is the mm -hmm. only way I'm going to be able to go in. So let me change my screen share to this screen, um, and then say, oh, how do I change which screen it's sharing? Um, huh. Are you able to just drag over the browser? No, because I shared, the way this works is I shared a specific, um, I never thought about this, is how do I change what screen I'm sharing. Um, so we may not be able to do this easily, okay. or we can, let me just, uh, let me just do something real quickly. Change, change screen. Yeah. Or I can try to hand you control and you can see if you can do it if you want to try to do that. Whatever you do prefer. Yeah. Let's, let's try that um, because that will change what is being done. So I'm going to go to you, Sam, and say switch presenter. Um, okay, so if you should be the presenter, when you click on that, that like play button, it should ask you which window you want to share. And if you share your browser, then we'll see that. Okay. And I, of course, need to join the meeting with a, um, so that I can see it as well. Ah. Are you able oh. to see the yes. RedCap? I can. Perfect. Okay. Um, so when you log into RedCap, it'll take you to this project screen. On the left-hand side, you have the left-hand toolbar, um, which is what you'll use a lot. Um, most of you will not have things like project setup or other functionality um, just because you don't need them. Um, so when you're adding a record, you will just go to the Add Edit Records over here, um, click on it, and then we're going to add a new record, and it will automatically generate an ID, and I'm going to remember to delete this one later. Um, so like I said, it just takes you to the event grid over here. Um, you can click on, you don't have to go in order. Like for some reason, um, if you're missing things, you can enter other data. Please do make sure you enter the patient consent at the very least. Um, but you don't have to go in order. So for instance, after enrollment, if you know, you're not doing an annual visit type thing, you could go straight to pre-op. Um, so we're going to go to the demographics form real quick. Um, Let's say your, your site's obfuscated ID is this one. We will tell you each site what your ID is. Um, you'll provide the patient's date of birth, so 4-11-1988. Um, um, patient's gender, um, race, these things. And then you can mark it as complete. And if you click here, you can save and go to the next form. And I find that's the easiest to do when you're doing these events so that you get all of the forms that you're able to do, um, and it'll just take you through them. Um, there are some values that must be provided. Um, it won't, it's not a hard, um, hard requirement, it's soft. So if I don't click anything here and I try and 
save and go to the next form, it's going to give me a window um, and say, you need to provide a value for this, but you can ignore it and go on, but you shouldn't. <laughs> um, so we're going to say their consent was wavered um, and they want to consent for um, the patient, uh, the community registry right there, and the date of consent today. So we're marking it as complete again. And you know, we're done with this. We didn't take vital signs. So we're going to save and exit. And we're going to do um, some information on the pre-op. Um, so maybe we didn't have vital signs, but we want to go through um, like the pre-op visit and um, just describe what information we have here. Um, it's REDCap is very user-friendly, I feel. Um, I think so long as you know what questions are asking, you shouldn't have any problems. It's pretty easy to navigate once you get the hang of it. Um, so this column over here, the unenroll column, it's at the very end because hopefully we won't be using it very often. But if someone did want to unenroll from the registry, you would just say the patient wants to withdraw um, the date and then the reason they withdrew. And that way we would know um, not to continue collecting data on them. Uh, can I ask a question? What yes. if you have a child, a child who passes away? Mm, that's a great question. Um, so are they technically disenroll? Are they unenrolled? I think I'll let go with that. So I, I would be inclined not to unenroll them. I actually think we haven't thought about that and how we would have a, a form and a field that indicated that. Um, but that's a great, um, I, 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 so I would leave them in, enrolled unless there's, uh, I, I can't imagine there's a legality issue, especially since this is all waiver. But, um, and I think that's a thing we're going to need to discuss in like 2.0. It's how do we capture, um, you know, patient death. Um, yeah. Yeah, so for some, you know, some of the kids who have intrathecal baclofen pumps, as an example of a subpopulation that we're not focusing a lot on at the moment, but we hope to be following, uh -huh. um, some of those are, are fragile and don't um, survive, for, uh, right. not necessarily related to their intervention, but die of other things or whatever. Right. Um, so I know in following our cohort of clinical intrathecal baclofen pumps here in Seattle, we have had kids pass away or they pass away from seizure disorder or something else or whatever. But um, it, I, we just want to, you know, on our end, we have internal mechanisms to make sure that we don't contact those families to be in a research study if the child has passed away, for example, uh, that kind of thing. But, yeah, right. that's a great point. And one of the nice things about REDCap is even once we move um, the registry into production mode where, you know, changes can't be made easily, we can still add fields um, without too much difficulty. So if things like that come up, we would love to hear um, your input on fields that needed to be added or changed to make it easier, one, for you to input data and two, to make sure that, you know, we're capturing all of these things that need to be captured. Um, my other thought as to um, if an individual is deceased, we I believe according to the IRB, we're still able um, to use data that has already been collected, um, regardless of whether the patient has unenrolled. Um, to my knowledge, that's what it says. So. Um, oh, that's that's very interesting. So we could use unenroll with recent and could ca capture. Yeah. Yeah. Add a field here and maybe not just as a free text, but um, have a multiple choice here just so that um, it's easier to indicate um, so that maybe we won't contact them for future information, um, as that would probably be a bit insensitive. Um, but we would still be able to um, use the information that had already been collected. That's to my knowledge. I could be wrong on that. You talk to Jacob, but I, I feel fairly sure that that's well. what it is. And, and Christy, you should at least rest assured on the, you know, there's no contact data in the CPRN registry. So there's, yes, right. you yeah, know, that I, would I be a, that. yeah. But I'm just, okay. I'm just thinking, I'm just thinking of, you know, with the patient reported outcomes and stuff, you know, so, you know, um, and we have to think about that for the parent and patient reported outcomes, you know, so a family participates for a period of time and then their child passes away. It's just, just something to think about down the road. The other Assumption is uh, we're not allowed probably to load any load any forms until the consent 
uh, form is completed, and uh, by default, most of these are all waiver, right? Right. So we, wouldn't, we wouldn't be allowed to go forward to fill out within REDCAMP to fill out any of the other forms unless consent is done. Is that true? Um, no. So you are able to fill out the rest of those forms. Like I said, it's not like a hard um, requirement, okay. Okay. but we do need to, like, because it is waivered for most people, like, do provide a value here just so that we can assure that, you know, this is the type of consent that is being provided for this patient, regardless of whether it's a waiver or not. Um, just so long as we have something clicked there, it's just important oh. for the IRB. I think they tend to get upset with that. So, yeah. well, and, I, yeah. and I would be inclined to make the... I would like the, to see it hard, to be honest. I don't think... <laughs> I mean, I mean, this, um, that's the precursor of, of uh, most of the sites that they're getting a waiver of consent. I, yeah. There's a part of me that would like to see that that, is a re that field has to be filled in before you're allowed to load any other data. Well, I, think, I don't know. Yeah, no, I agree okay. with you. Um, the problem with trying to do that is you're able to make hard requirements when you're in survey mode. Um, like ah. I can show you what that looks like, but this is data entry mode. And so theoretically, um, you can't um, force it because you're seeing the back end. Um, yeah, so this I see. is kind of what a survey mode looks like. And this is a, you know, you have to do it. So right. if I try to submit, it won't let me go forward. Um, but because we're not entering data in survey mode, we're doing it through this way. Um, which I think ultimately is the better way to do it for this project just because um, we're not sending surveys out to patients, you know, we're having um, staff do chart reviews and enter this data, those sort of things. Um, so it makes sense to have it this way, but it's also, um, it has its challenges as well. So it's just one of those things mm -hmm. people need to be aware of. Okay. Any yeah, other so questions? That's a great point, though, Christine. In fact, I, it's you, you cued me into the, the pro registry needs to make sure we grapple with this. Uh, yeah, I don't know what the answer is. Or, like, I, I totally understand from a programming perspective within RedCap. But when I think about the, the larger picture of all 18 sites, and we're all predicated on this is a really a very large retrospective chart review, you know, mm -hmm. low yeah, yeah. definition. And all of our IRBs, uh, what, however they approve or don't approve or whatever, are totally, like, we're relying on Nationwide, and we're relying on Nationwide because it's de-identified and, um, you know, it's a waiver. And so I think we need to make sure that we have that, our ducks in a row, that's all. Yeah, no, it's, it's, a, it's a fair fair point. I think I'm going to, I want to think through the sites that are not, they're like so far the only sites that are not wavered are, are going to be epic and I need to and there's a dialogue going on between them as to how they're tracking that and we need to kind of make sure we're in the middle of that to make sure that when we pull the data together we do the right things and whatnot. So it's a very it's a good point. Yeah, and then and and then going forward thinking for the future, like when we add the patient reported outcomes, um, Seattle children at that time may decide that we're not reliant on nationwide for that portion. Right. Of, right, because it's going to be more, it's relatively more prospective because we're not doing patient recorded outcomes necessarily within our clinical practice. So it's not a retrospective chart review. So we could have our reliance information for our retrospective chart review part, but then if going forward we have a protocol that's asking us to say, do the CP child or whatever, I'm just making that up, Right. Then we will have a local IRB, and we will actually have some type of an electronic IRB um, consent process on an iPad or whatever. But right. Then right. we would have to update that within CPRN for that information. Right. Um, something to think about. I'm not sure how all the other sites' IRBs are going to handle it, but that's my guess of what's going to happen here in Seattle from our IRB regulatory perspective. Yep. Sorry to, sorry to distract you guys. No, it's good, definitely. Um, are there any other questions or things that I can show you to make this easier? Um, Neil, do you have any thoughts or questions on things here? I know you'll be doing this, I think, right? Yeah, it looks good. Thank you, Sam. Sure.
Um, am I able to turn this back over to you, Paul? Or? You should be able. I can probably steal it back. I'm taking a note, so hold on one second. Um, okay, so yes, I should be able to go like this and say, let's try not to drop Sam. <laughs> stop, pre stop presenter. I should have control now, and we should be back to PowerPoint and data collection details. So everybody seeing that? Yeah. Yep. Thank okay. you. Great. You're up, Sam, I think. Oh, okay. I thought you were doing these. Okay. Um, so the data collection time points that we have here, um, obviously the annual clinic visits, which theoretically should be spaced a year apart, but we know how that goes, so they may not be. Um, Pre-op clinic visits, um, for any CP-related surgery, neurosurgery, or, or orthopedic, and then post-op dis discharge um, following that surgery, um, as well as any post-op clinic follow-ups um, for the uh, surgeries captured above. Um, basically, like we said before, um, the registry is set up longitudinally. We do want to track repeat visits as, as much as we possibly can, um, and the registry is planned to continue for the life of the network, so there's really no specific endpoint. Um, so you may have many, many instances for one specific patient, um, and that's a good thing. The more data we have over time, the better analyses we can do. So um, if you want to go to the next slide. Sure. Now, I'll give you a data point. Like on HCRN now, we have over 5,000 patients, over 10,000 uh, events. Um, so since kids with hydrocephalus tend to get repeat surgeries, kind of like uh, CP kids often get multiple surgeries. So there's you know a lot of data there over uh, over time for single patients. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and so for data collection procedures, we're currently working on a manual of operations over here at the DCC. Um, and I'm not sure if other sites have started um, such documents, but we want to try and make sure that it's um, as uniform as possible. Um, with, you know, how everyone is collecting data. Um, we also understand that this is a pilot, um, so there's, you know, going to be variability, um, and there's going to be difficulties, and we are going to respond to those difficulties as best we can. Um, so we want you to help us in setting protocols um, for this. We would love your feedback as we go along. Please um, email me as much as you need um, with any sort of difficulties um, or challenges or even just simple fixes that can make it easier for you. Um, with this, it's important for us to be able to determine, you know, the volume for each clinic and how much time is going to be allocated for data abstraction. Um, and so I'm not sure what measures or scales we're currently using. Um, I think it's just going to be on a site-by-site basis to sort of determine these things, um, but we would like to, you know, be in the loop so we know what resources um, the sites are expending. Um, yeah, let me, let me make clear something on that. Um, so as an example, we, so what we're not trying to do is be protocol driven for this. So uh, let me take um, Tardu versus Mountain Modified Ashworth. Uh, we have support for both of those scales, knowing that most sites use one or the other, or in some cases different uh, disciplines use different um, scales for related or different reasons. So we've got them there. Part of this is a data collection for variability in practice. Do not look at these and kind of go, oh, we didn't do this. Um, it's really you know, if, if you do it in your practice, we want to capture that and we're going to run this for a period of time and then maybe we will make some, you know, standards to say we, we want, you know, to participate in the registry, you have to use Tardu. Um, but, you know, that at this point, we're not making that distinction. Um, great. So, and then the next slide is just, you know, our contact information for Jacob and I. So again, if you have any questions regarding REDCap, how to complete forms, um, items on a form for a given subject, um, you can contact me, my email's right there. And then just sort of network operations for IRB, BAA agreements, um, you can contact Jacob. And we're both pretty responsive to email. Um, I'm here in the office full time now, so um, shouldn't have a problem emailing either of us. 
Sam, do you really not have an HSC in front of your uh, Utah EDU? I don't, um, because I was a student at the U first. Got it. At the U at Utah. I may eventually acquire one. It's unclear, but I'll keep you updated. At Utah is correct. Okay, I've never made. I've never noticed in all the times I've mailed you. So um, yes. I just type Sam, and you come up in Gmail. So perfect. Um, That's all that matters. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I, have a, I have a question. I know there's a um, an IRB agreement at the University of Utah that I I here in Seattle. But I don't need it for regulatory. Um, I'm assuming that is that something that we need will be notified about, or we need to worry about, or that's, you guys are just taking care of that. We don't. I, mean, I was not asked about it for our reliant IRB. So, Sam, you want me to address, or you? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. So, what we discovered shortly after our last training, or right around the time of our last training, was yeah. that to collect the data centrally, as opposed to having you run a red cap instance and then move us, you know, extracts from red cap, that we needed an IRB agreement um, for the University of Utah and. Then that happened to fall right when they were reorganizing their IRB. <laughs> and so we had this oh. long delay before we actually got the IRB approval. But we got the IRB approval a bit ago. I don't think you need it for any reason. We needed it okay. to allow you to start to enter data for all appropriate you know, protections. Yep, exactly. So um, we should be fine going forward. Um, and of course, Jacob or I will keep you, or Paul will keep you, you know, apprised of if that's something we need to, to question. Um, so the next slide is just talking about, um, let's see, the CPRN network ID. So that was just the ID that we showed you before. CPRN, the obfuscated site acronym, and then the five-digit patient number, which is just automatically generated with REDCap. Um, and I think here, Paul, on the next slide we have, yes, the patient tracking sheet. So this was just what Paul was mentioning before, just making sure you have a linkage between, you know, um, a patient's MRN and uh, the CPRN site ID. The red cap ID column, I don't think that's um, really necessarily something we need anymore just because the red cap ID is these last five digits. Um, they're just appended to this. Is that... That's how that's, it is. That's correct. Perfect. Um, okay. Yeah, I think this was designed before we actually, we, we wrote this before we actually had implemented it. I think in the last call we kind of went, oh, <laughs> we forgot the little crosswalk ID. Um, yeah. So we had a little mm -hmm. scramble. Um, uh, the other thing I would say is we also have clinician um, obfuscated IDs. We this is something we, we actually haven't thought about completely, Sam. I realize um, that we have them for each of the network PIs. Um, so, you know, for example, there's one for uh, Michael and there's one for Tom uh, at Gillette. But there's not one for every person who might be, you know, touching a patient where that they're the source of the data. And it's interesting that in the, when we're doing it from the EMR base, you know, we've got the clinicians filling out those forms. So this is a thing that I, I realize we probably are missing. And I'm trying to think, Sam, can you think of where there are, I know there's surgeon specific um, uh, IDs that are supposed to go in for the, the surgical things, but I don't know if we actually have enough obfuscated IDs developed and handed out, like, you know. Um, not to my knowledge, no. Um, and my other thought is if this is something we wanted to do during the analysis, um, we could do that as well, just depending. I mean, I think having the obfuscated ID entered in initially is probably better, um, but if it's something that we, we aren't able to, to do, I think it would be fine to do during the analysis process. Yeah, I'd um, love to get it sooner than that. You know, so Christy, for example, at your site, I, um, you know, I know we have one for you. I don't think we have another clinician code. Now, you know, abstracted data is different from uh, right. EMR entered data just because 
you've got multiple people doing entries. But so, Michael, in your environment, is there another pediatric neurosurgeon, A, and B, will they be, um, you know, performing CP-related surgeries that your guys are going to want to capture for your site? Yeah. Uh, short answer is this is true not just for neurosurgery but for all of our disciplines. So there are four neurosurgeons about all of whom do pumps and rhizotomies because we all have separate spasticity evaluation clinics to be at, and then we stick with those patients thereafter. Likewise for um, orthopedics and physiatry, um, you know, everybody does injection therapies, et cetera. So I, we've been talking about, um, and Jen can chime in on this, we've been talking about starting off with defining which clinic shall we target first for uh, enrolling patients? So, for example, we, we do run people through a centralized spasticity evaluation clinic to decide if they should be rhizotomy patients, pump patients, neither. Uh, but they are actually, interestingly, they're often new to us because they're getting care elsewhere and have been referred specifically to address tone management. But then whatever procedures come out of that, our plan is that, that Jen and potentially in the future as volume changes, another coordinator would basically actively pursue, you know, where did this individual go and who is doing what and coordinate the data entry that way. Right. So I think the thing that we should we need to add to this, Sam, is I think we need to show which forms have uh, clinician, surgeon IDs, and then similar to this table we have here, we need to ask them to keep a table that is um, clinician identifying information, and they just need to assign a unique code and fill that in. Because yeah. we don't we don't need unlike the one where we generated them for the site and we need to manage that. Um, I don't think we I think we just need them to generate this and because they're going to all be on the, under the umbrella of one site, um, and we just need to make sure that if they you know replace a, a surgeon they generate a new number kind of thing. So um, we'll, we'll have to follow up with that. Yeah, agreed. So, so at this point, um, uh, uh, since we're heart, heart extraction at Gillette and here in Seattle, you want us to keep track of the, the surgeons, the orthopedic and the neurosurgeons, and probably the rehab medicine doctors because they would be doing procedures as well? So yeah, I think what I would say, Sam, can you quickly tell which, which ones? I know that we have like three or four forms that, that collects, collect IDs. Do you remember uh, which they are? So I think as far as, from what I can see so far, the only forms that collect uh, surgeon IDs is the pre-op forms, but I haven't gone through all of them yet. I'm clicking furiously right now. Um, How about for Botox injections? Well, that would... Go ahead, Sam. So I think that would be um, good for us to have. It doesn't look like it's in there right now at all, though. Well, actually, so Botox injections are in orthopedic. Does orthopedic not capture surgeon ID? That's what I'm and looking at. Oh, Botox injections are done by the rehab medicine. Yeah, I know, but it wouldn't um, all, but, but the thing is. Oh, I see. Yeah, it could be captured in the orthopedic. You're right. It could be. You're going to need to use the orthopedic form. This was a topic that I don't even know that we fully resolved, but Jilda raised as she didn't like what, what the orthopedic surgeons had picked for uh, muscle groups to, that were targets. So, ah, uh, the joy of a of a multidiscipline yeah. database. Um, yeah, so it looks like um, the orthopedic um, physical examination form um, does ask for um, an orthopedic attending provider ID. Um, so those appear to be the only two instances that I'm seeing requests for surgeon IDs. Um, and the physical examination, um, it looks like, let's see, different kinds of tests and assessments, uh, spinal sitting exam, sitting in chair, gait observation. Um, I'm not seeing Botox. So I, I will bet you that we will value having a clinician identifier for every, you know, um, we have some issues that we're going to need to resolve for places where there's a multidiscipline clinic 
and you only want to have one set of uh, things to say, you know, which ID trumps or which answer trumps if you have two different sort of range of motion assessments and things like that. And those are some things we're going to need to experience on our body and figure out the best resolution. We pick some. Uh, but I, I have a feeling we're going to bet it's going to be good to have that if you're doing the the medical history form, it would be good to know which clinician did that. Um, yeah. And I don't know if you had, I don't know if you guys have that in in the medical record to abstract. Is that clearly there? Like if you're looking at data that's on medical history, that you know which physician gathered it. Oh yeah, totally. Okay. Uh, at, at Seattle, our medical history is mostly coming from our either developmental medicine, rehab medicine doctor, or, or neurology. They're usually the people who sure. see this child first. Right. Um, and then, um, but then um, we we can keep locally in our own. We can track who the provider is that gave us that information. We could also track who did the Botox injection. We can track. And then we obviously will be tracking the orthopedic surgeon or the neurosurgeon. For yeah, I just, I just, I wonder if this is not a, a an important missed opportunity where, anyway, we can, you can track that for now. You only have a few that we're going to require on those forms. And what I would say is you should make sure you, you're you tracking for those forms another, you know, another tab in the spreadsheet that says, um, you know, surgeon ID and that you're entering that for when you're doing those surgical uh, forms. Right. I know we are. We locally have our team has already had a discussion about. Um, you see GMFCS dictated in notes, and sometimes the surgeons don't agree with the rehab medicine doctor and or the physical mm -hmm. therapist or whatever. And so we, as a team, have decided that um, there's a set of providers that will trump everybody else. So yeah. So. Well, that's that. That is a dialogue that we've had a bunch and not not fully resolved. Right, right. And and it may vary from site to site. Right. What the answer might be because um, really depending upon, um, yeah, anyway. More questions, anyway. I, I just have one question. Michael, if the, if the neurosurgeon and the orthopedic surgeon disagree, who's right? <laughs> the rehab physician. <laughs> No, very, very good. That was very good. Um, okay. Um, although you, you you should have said the PT given given the uh, attendance, but that's okay. Um, um, okay. Any other questions? So is Redcap ready for us to load, or are we still waiting? Um, so what I need to do is I just need to move it into production mode, which just involves me emailing the REDCap administrator and saying, hey, lock this so we can't make more changes. Um, so what I can do after this call is, Paul, maybe you and I can talk about whether we want to add more um, fields for provider IDs in different forms. Um, I think we have all the other changes made. Um, and then other than that, I think we're ready. And I can send out an email to let everyone know when it's moved into production mode. Yeah, I, I don't want to make any quick ads. I, I, you know, I think this is a thing we're going to need to think about. I, um, I am not, we're, you know, this is a pilot, and I think it's okay to go. So I would not, I would not get between you and the, the chance to turn it on over something like that. Okay, so I will, I can move it to production right now. Then, if we're good, or we can talk after the call. That's fine too. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm good with that. I mean, I'm, I'm fine. I think we've been ready okay. to go for a long time. Um, Great. So as soon okay. as they I'll send an email out and um, we can let everyone know. Awesome. So we'll expect an email. This is exciting. Sort of like yeah. a long, long, long gestation. And now we're having yeah. a birth. That yes. So to speak. It's all it's all relative, Christy. Um, so yeah. it is. Uh, it is. Yeah, um, I think we're moving fast at one level and slower than molasses at another level. So, uh, but uh, let's yeah. let's forge ahead. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Neil, are you how are you feeling, Neil? Any questions? That was great, thank you. No, no questions. Yeah, just really don't hesitate to drop any and all of us mail if you run into questions. You know, it's yeah. we're all you know we're all um, you know moving this this 
ball down the road. So, um, okay, well, thank you all for your uh, time and commitment to this, and uh, uh, yeah, keep us in the loop. Let us know how it's going, and, and uh, you'll get mail from Sam about Go shortly. Sounds yep. great. We'll, we'll look forward to and we'll be sending you emails for sure. Great. <laughs> Perfect. Good. I look forward to it. Okay. Thank you so much, you guys. Thank you. Thanks, Thank everyone. You.